Welcome to B-Size Boston 2016. This is our fourth annual uh, B-Size Boston. Uh, probably the biggest one we've had. All is sold out. So I'm so glad you guys were able to get tickets and the able to um, I'd like to present our first speaker of the morning, Nicole Masimo. Uh, he has 10 years of professional experience worked in eight different startups, um, worked in information technology all across the globe, many different countries. He has a PhD from Cambridge University in computational neuroscience. Um, he has affiliations with MIT and the Singularity University. And his current work here that he will be presenting to us is information driven product design. Um, so I'm so looking forward to this one. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hi, everyone. How's it going? Hey, it's so, so today's topic is to present you a new, a new design framework for product design. I call it information driven product design. For the lack of a better word. Um, but I, I must admit, this is the first time I'm giving this talk, so it's still a bit fresh. So I'm very, very thankful if you can give me feedback and you know, participate. So I'm a bit nervous about it. <laughs> cool. Um, so let me give you a bit of context first why, why I think it's an important topic. Um, I think there is a shortage of skills. If you look around, uh, Forbes estimates that there are a million cybersecurity jobs open right now worldwide. And you know, in a couple of years, I know, right? That's, that's <laughs> wow, what I was thinking. Fact, <laughs> that's, that's what I was thinking. Um, and in a couple of years, there will be six million jobs open worldwide. That's fine. I, can you give me the next I think. So, you know, six million job openings for cyber security. It's, it's pretty great. If you ever work for cyber security startup, you will know how difficult that's to recruit you. And you know, if any one of you is looking for a job, you can um, <laughs> And same for data scientists, you know, data scientists again, is the best job in the world. Um, I don't know whether any one of you regrets not to be a data scientist, I definitely do. Um, so, so there is definitely a gap in skills right now and the foreseeable future. And so this talk is a little bit about how to reach this gap and how to kind of educate product managers. So it's, it's mainly for product managers, but hopefully you as a cybersecurity community can give me feedback how to improve the talk and how to give them even more. So, so let me give you a little bit of uh, background on product management and acknowledge that there are other frameworks. And to be honest, I think there are around 50 different frameworks. It seems like every big company has their own framework. Um, SAP has one, IBM has one. Um, I don't know who doesn't have one. Um, even Google has their own uh, design framework. You know, like let's pick one. Particular one in this case, uh, I'd like to talk about the Stanford uh, framework. It's also used by IDEO. It's called design thinking. It's very popular. So just to give you a feedback, what what are design frameworks? Let's go through one of them, and you know, let, let's maybe work through it together. I know it's early in the morning, so let, 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 let's do it collaboratively. Um, so design framework, design thinking consists out of four stages, they kind of iteratively. But you start with empathy. And then you define the problem, you ideate about a couple of solutions, and then you, you start prototyping. So let me give you a particular example from my personal experience. Uh, so I went to Japan and I worked on a startup, kind of, let's see what we can help the Japanese with in terms of technologies. And one of the ideas that we had, like, how can we teach kids to code? You know, it's a popular thing nowadays, everyone wants to do the same thing, like, let's teach them how to, how to code. Sounds like a good idea, right? So, in the beginning, it went terribly wrong. So, what, what do you think went wrong? Yeah. A couple of ideas. I mean, the minute. Probably too complicated. Probably not talking very well. So yeah. So maybe it was too complicated. But I mean, I mean, it's kids, so we kind of adjusted it. So, so the yeah. kids hated it. Someone to keep going after you walk away. For the kids, right? Yes. But but think about Japanese kids. Like that's the, the there are some specifics, right? What, what could be specific about Japanese kids that kind of made it different? Or Japanese uh, and people environment, culture? They, they weren't telling you, they weren't giving you feedback. They weren't giving you feedback, right? Things like that. So, so that's the part of empathy, right? So you want to emphasize and try to understand what is happening, um, ideally even before you fail. Um, and you know, that's why this framework is so popular. So in, in our case, the, the, the problem that happened and the mistakes that happened was we didn't take into account Japanese mothers, right? So it turns out Japanese mothers really hate that. 
Uh, they think <laughs> entrepreneurs are failures in life. Everyone wants to have a government job. Uh, they think engineers are auto mechanics. And if you do this, you, you disappoint your family. So it's a, it's a cultural change, and I'm sure you're not with that. Uh, so once you define this problem like that, right, then you can understand, like, okay, so we still want to do coding. We think this is the right thing to do. But we do have a problem, and we emphasize, and so we understood what the problem was. And so then you can start iterating on top of it. And so what we did is we decided to, to do um, a thing about robots, right? Everyone in Japan likes robots. So we said, okay, there are all these robots. Um, manipulate robots. Right? So we will teach you how to manipulate robots. And, and the mother's love that they're like, great thing. And, and coding was just a side effect, because it turns out to manipulate robots, you need to do some coding. So we kind of sneaked it. That's a, an example of a design framework. Um, the, the framework that we talk about today is information. Is based on information theory. Um, just kind of by a show of hands, how many of you are familiar with information theory? All right. I mean, it's, it's a very cool thing, you know, like I did background in computational neuroscience and it's like one of the really good theories in terms of how the brain works and how, how to work with it. So, it, it was invented by Claude Shannon. Uh, he, he recently celebrated for so much sleep. It's 100 years birthday. But I learned everything from David McKay, who is kind of uh, a, a very famous guy and also unfortunately died this year. So, that's kind of my way of commemorating him. Um, the main point of information theory is this equation. So uh, H is the, the, the letters that they use to kind of summarize it, the word uh, information, and P is the probability of the events that are happening. So it's a function of probability. So let me give you a couple of examples to kind of make it more intuitive. So imagine you have a door, and out of this door uh, you have a sheep coming out. Right? So you have one sheep coming out, one white sheep, another white sheep, another white sheep, and they keep coming out, and you're like, okay, there are lots of white sheep, I'm kind of getting bored of this white sheep, right? Um, hey, what happened? I want my white sheep back. <laughs> um, so, so, imagine that's happening. Oh, yeah? Just like that? Yeah. Okay, well, I mean, the good news is for this thing, we don't actually need that. The, 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 the. So, they keep coming out. And you, you count the sheep, the first sheep, third sheep, fourth sheep. And then suddenly, instead of one of the white sheep, a black sheep comes out. You've never seen a black sheep before. You're like, wow, that's a big surprise. So information is kind of a measure of surprise. Like, you have something that came out with a low probability. That's, that's a high information carrying event, right? Does that make sense? All right, cool. Um, I think the password to do that. <laughs> Scary woman. Uh, um, <laughs> look, look too short. <laughs> I know, right? No, yeah. It's his temporary password. I, I, it's his temporary. I mean, I switched everything. Like, this is a burn. It's <laughs> interesting. <laughs> um, so, information is measured as a probability, and the low probability events carry the most information. <laughs> that projector doesn't like the slide. Maybe it doesn't really like the slides. Or maybe I did it on purpose. That's actually a good point. Um, so, the, the main point about information theory is a very peculiar property of information theory, which is it doesn't really care about the value of the event. So, it only cares about the probability. If something has more value to you than less value to you, it doesn't incorporate that. So, if you like black sheep, you like black sheep, it doesn't matter. Right? So let me give you another example. So you have this white sheep coming out, and they keep coming out of this uh, door, and then suddenly out of this door jumps a big tiger. Right? So the first thing that I do is get the hell out of it. But, but so tiger makes a big difference versus a black sheep. Right? Black sheep are exciting, but tigers are um, more valuable to me than black sheep. Right? Uh, but information theory doesn't capture this. So this is kind of the key property. This is the reason why we use information theory to, for this product design. Is because we say we will not a priori assign any value to to the information. We will not say this information is more valuable than that. We'll just say we don't know what the value is of the information. We will treat it all in fashion. Does that make sense? Anyone has questions about information? While well, we learn about projectors. <laughs> <laughs> Slides are really just background for this. I normally hate slides, but then you stand with it like uh, straight in the back. So. 
Um, so, so let me give you an example of how information-driven product design can contribute to kind of the data science part of it, right? So back in the days, I used to work in a, in a, in a matchmaking company, like dating, boys and girls, right? So uh, we had like 10 million clients, we had boys and girls, and the, the, and the trick was to, to match them, and I was the data scientist who created this algorithm. So, you know, before Tinder, like 2008. <laughs> How many of you are used to that? <laughs> no. No. There is my man. Um, so before data science even existed. So when I came into this company, they had loads of data. They had all this information that they had. And they had like the names of the people, the location, uh, whether they like cats or dogs, what, what's their color, how much they expected the salary, right? All of that stuff. And and we came in and we started analyzing this data and turned out none of this was actually important to, to do the matching for a particular problem, right? I, I looked even further and I realized that the only thing that was really predictive of success was the activity of the people. You know, how often do they log in, how fast do they respond? I mean, I call it kind of how desperate that. <laughs> and, you know, like just a personal tip, if you were wondering why no one responds to your Tinder, try changing the activity. I'm not saying that's, that's what they use as a predictor, but activity is a very strong factor in this case. Yeah. So, so the main point of this example, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to go through a lot of the product design examples and show you how information works, right? The main point of this example is, when I came in, none of the engineers in this entire technology was recording any of this data. Because they were like, hey, we, um, we care about cats, we care about salary, we care about your name. But they didn't really understand that if you record all of this data, in the background, you can actually build a better data. Okay. Because that's not how product managers think. It. So that's kind of the idea of information driven product design. Do not a priori think that there is valuable information and less valuable information. You will never know. You're not the data scientist. You, you will never know what really correlates. Just make sure that you record all of it and it will work out. Yeah. So let me give you another example. How does it go? Right. So far, so far. <laughs> Does anyone want to have a bath? You need to increase your activity. <laughs> right? Um, so let's see. So that was the first example, right? So the data science example with the matchmaking, where we say, um, right? where we say, record all the information. I, I even had a data slide. So maximize the information that you take. Record everything that you can. And, and of course, the caveat here is record all the information that you can as long as it doesn't impede the user. That, that's the key. Because if you have to ask too many questions, then the user is like, oh, man, I'm bored with that stuff. Right? If you can record information in the background without kind of stopping the user from experiencing a good product, that's the best thing. And let me, yeah, please. So um, you have to upfront how important is it to decide your success criteria? How do you know your algorithms work? So that's the thing, like, when you're designing the product, don't think about the algorithm. Don't, don't think like you're the data scientist and you will know what to report, right? That I have the same thing, like I use the data scientist, and I thought that I know what to report. Well, I'm not asking like, what you, like, I, I, get what oh, saying, I, I guess you're saying reporting lots of data, you yeah. don't know what's going to be predicted. Correct. But what are you trying to predict? Oh, no, in this case, it's always different, right? So okay. let me give you a match um, Let's face it, it's a, it's a it's a company, right? It's, it's making money. Well, so the, predict the predictor that we want to do is how to optimize the money generation. Right, right, right. Yeah, well, I guess what I'm saying is, though, when you're thinking about, when you're saying, you know, collecting lots of bits and all the data you can, um, but do you also do you make a decision up front of what your success criteria looks like? Don't. No, not, you do or you don't? Don't. You, you don't? Okay, don't. okay. Because okay. you will never know. The CEO comes to you and they say we want user growth instead of revenue. Oh, okay, okay. And then yeah. you're like, okay. oh, damn it, I, I had a really good algorithm, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so, so that's the thing, like, what, 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 what is the aim of this talk? To, to create a system that kind of reduces the shortage of the cybersecurity and data scientists, right? If we already have a data scientist, they will tell you, but how do they know, right? I was a data scientist, I came and I didn't know what it would turn out. Right? So yeah. build, build a product, that, yeah. build a product that enables it. Let me give you maybe a um, a, a more interesting example. This is from 2011. Um, probably many of you have heard of it. 
Uh, so you can detect the person from the history, post post login. How many of you know about this? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right? Okay. So well, that's another surprising thing, right? So we had all this data for, for years, I mean basically for quite a lot of time, right? And then somebody comes in and starts looking at the features and, and, and it turns out you can predict it very well. Right? It depend it doesn't depend on how fast the person is typing, none of that stuff, right? Um, that, that it makes sense. So the person is typing it depends on the, the gaps that you create, the features that you create in, in between the specific keystrokes you can detect the person. No one knew about it. Same thing with mouse movements, right? So quite a lot of companies do right now uh, mouse movements to detect whether it's a real person logging in. Um, so these were the two examples of you know how data science, um, how if you want to do information driven product design, do not be partial, do not think that you know it better, just record everything, um, as long as it doesn't impede the user. It's a shame we don't have that on the screen, but um, have you ever seen a login field, right? So I have a login field on the page. Um, so when you log in, back in the days, what the response was, if you mistype the email or the password, it tells you, hey, we don't have this user, we don't have this email, in the, in the, in the database. Do you know what I'm So then the school changed a little bit and people were saying, well, you shouldn't expose this information to the user. You shouldn't tell them that this email doesn't exist because then the bad guys will do something about it. Right? Does it all make sense? It turns out, like, I thought this is like a given, I thought this is like the foundation of cybersecurity. But if you actually go into Facebook, Google and LinkedIn right now, they actually tell you that this account doesn't exist. So the only company that's, uh, that actually does not tell you that. And, and you know, I mean, so this is the classical example. So back in the day, you didn't want to expose this one bit of information. Right? This, this one extra bit saying that this email and password combination doesn't exist, it's just one extra bit. And so that, that's how you should think about it. One little bit matters, right, from cybersecurity. And you know, I mean, this is data leakage. It's been around for years, like if you're cybersecurity, you find it boring. But for product managers, they, they don't think like that. And let, let me give you a more relevant example. Um, the battery API, HTML5. How many have heard of you that you can fingerprint a person based on their battery charge? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. So that's in 2015, so relatively recent. But it's very cool. So based on your battery, you can see which person is accessing your website, um, and you can track them according to the website that they access. Um, and the reason why, why, why this works is because the battery information is using a float number, uh, which has a very strong, a big precision. Right? So you come in, you have this uh, battery discharge, and it has a big number, and then you go to another website, and the people say, okay, it's the same person with the same battery level to, to this digital right? track. So the, the only thing that you have to do to fix it is instead of reporting it as a float, report it as an engine. Right? That's a very simple thing to do. Um, that's how they fixed it. Like literally, there was no discussion after this. Guys figured it out. They they basically changed it from float to an end, and everything was fine. But this is the type of thinking that you need to do, right? You need to be thinking: Am I am, am I giving one bit of information away? Like literally, every bit matters. Right? Does, does it kind of make sense? And this is how kind of it looks like when you when you combine these two things, right? So th what, what's the difference between this login screen and this login screen? Uh, Google can actually track all the information that they can. They, they keep, they store everything, like the ID, the timing, when you log in, everything, right? And so they create some sort of, I don't know, I mean, obviously I don't know what Google, like, that's the hypothesis. But they, they track some sort of, is, is this the right user? And if you are, un above a certain score, then they kind of show you your picture and show you the email that you're looking at. So you come in and they say, hey, here is your name, here is your picture, here is your email, please put in the password. But if you're below a certain score, then they're not. So that's kind of, you know, in the application, information-driven product design, when you record everything you can, because storage is free. Yeah. Don't, don't think of storage as a problem. And then you use that to kind of adjust how much information you expose and how much you so that's kind of um, so that's kind of the first part of the talk, um, where you know, like I, I showed you how information driven product design can um, help you with uh, data science when you say I want to report all the information I can, and how you can do 
it's for cybersecurity where you want to minimize the information that you expose to the to the user, right? So that that kind of my summary. Any questions? So as far as you know, we were talking earlier about just sort of collecting all kinds of data and doing our analytics. What sort of can you give some insight and techniques you can use? I mean, how would you keep this? No, but everything, like record everything. everything, like record all, all the things that you can record and then double on it. It's like this hiking, like when you when you want to go for a hike, make sure you have enough money. Yeah, but as far as like analytics, like what sort of analytics once you have all the data, like how do you how do you figure out what you need to figure out? Like Sitting through all this data. Well, look, I mean, so that, that's a different topic. Well, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But, but as I was saying, like, the key is not to focus on that because like, I, I give you an example. Like, for, for a long time, there was all this uh, supervised learning stuff, right? Let's have this uh, uh, data and uh, let's try to predict this with one variable. Right, right. Uh, so, right now, there's an entire movement in the opposite direction and the other direction of unsupervised learning, right? So, if you were focused on that stuff, all the data that you were creating, uh, might be not actually that useful. So that's kind of the thing. Like if you start thinking about like, what algorithm we're going to use, you, you will kind of miss out on all the really cool data. Mm -hmm. so, because the algorithm is actually changing. Right. That makes sense. And, and you know, I mean, like this way you kind of have a history of the data. Right? Like I understand that like, you can say, okay, we realize that now we will start reporting this very valuable data. But then you don't have the history. So if, if you actually think that this data will be very historically valuable, it's the key to record it now. So I mean, go, go back to your companies and tell them to, to remove it from the public websites who they work with, and you know, record everything else inside about your users. I guarantee you, you get the promotion. So actually, um, so if you have any you know, ideas for tools or anything like that that you recommend for going out there and serializing all these points of data for security perspective. Yeah, man, I think so far the only thing we found is to do it manually to, to find it. Yeah, it, it's super difficult. We actually build tools to find this information, right. but this is actually, like, this is how we make money. So, like, if you want to make lots of money, build such tools. And, and then you have collected all this information. Like, like I can give you one example. This, this is one of the projects I was working on in this month. We basically built an entire map of all the companies. Do you have any good models tools that you recommend? Or like, so, discovering more about data? All right, thank you very much.